Um, so our guests are Lisa Brickle and Shreya Rao. Uh, they've recently completed training and are training others in a Tall Trees, the Tall Trees campaign, uh, a campaign known as Rakao Roroa, and that roughly translates as Tall Trees. Tall Trees captures connotations of the strength, resilience and leadership of people with lived experience rising from the roots to the branches of our whenua, connecting and supporting one another to grow. In short, the goal of Rakao Rarai is growing mental health leaders for the future. So welcome, Lisa and Shreya, to take it from us. Uh, that sounds like a big job. Kia ora, thanks for having us. Kia ora. Kia ora. Yeah, well... Uh, it, it sounds like a big job. It, yes, definitely. <laughs> exciting <laughs> job, though. An exciting <laughs> job, Shreya. You're excited about the potential of this? I think we're so ready for it. I think with the last election and mental health being such a big issue, people really rallying around the cause, I think we're really ready for to take our mental health advocacy to the next level. Right. Well, it's, it's a wonderful sort of climate that we're working in, isn't yeah. it? Because uh, mental health is sort of... Uh, Top of uh, top of the pops in some ways. Just about every day, I check on my phone what the latest news is. Um, you know, mental health is definitely grabbing the headlines, and uh, yeah, it's uh, it's a new atmosphere that we're working in. Do you think that's going to be conducive to what uh, Tall Trees is about? Definitely, I think uh, coming in on the back of a lot of conversations, um, that's where we're going to see the change and having a bunch of tall trees who know how to have conversations in a safe way and have key messages that we know address stigma and discrimination yeah. um, will only enhance um, the existing conversations to a space where we can see, you know, our people experiencing positive um Reactions in their community. Right. Well, there's a lot of talk about conversations in New Zealand society. Lisa, have you sort of caught up with that? Conversations that we're having at the moment. Well, um, you know, we're we're being asked to to have conversations about a lot of social issues. You know, mm. I think that organisations are asking us to put our heads up above the parapet and talk about whether it be domestic violence or mental health or the prison population or who makes up the prison population. Mm. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a climate, I think, which is encouraged by this government yes. um, to, to have conversations. Yeah, to actually have dialogue around all of these different issues. And um, one thing, we, when we were doing the training, we talked about the power of contact and that's about having that connection and that contact with all sorts of people, people who might have differing views from us, right. but having that connection and that kind of equal status and that, you know, really trying to connect with them and reduce stigma and discrimination this way, I think that's a real key, is that, for that face-to-face right. actual, you know, contact, yeah. dialogue, conversation. Well, know. and contact and connection are so important in mental health, aren't they? Because mm. we hear about people being isolated, uh, perhaps uh, in a whole week, the, the only person they might talk to is their community support worker or peer support worker. Mm. Have you, either of you ever been in that sort of situation where your mental health has caused you to become isolated? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think for many, many years, <laughs> your only contact is uh, staff. People are paid to be there. And I think increasingly there's more and more people in our community who, you know, that's their only social contact. Um, interesting for me as a young person... Um, going online and making contact that way was helpful. Um, I got to have hard conversations in an anonymous way. Um, and also, for me, talking about hard stuff out loud is way too... <laughs> you know, it's way above me. So, yeah. But typing it up, weirdly, a lot easier. So, yeah, I guess I'm, some people disagree with me on that, but <laughs> that was my kind of experience, found that... The online world helped me come back into 
the real space, which is where the healing happened. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's it's uh, often very much about disclosure, isn't it? Disclosing mm-hmm. um, our emotional or mental health issues and fronting up to that. Uh, Lisa, you've been in the studio before a couple of years ago. You reminded me and uh, about the production. You were the producer of Mockingbird, the play. Or? Yeah, I was. So I wrote it, and I was uh, one of the actors in it, and. Um, yeah, and just talking about isolation as she relates directly to that play in my own experience. But, um, you know, there's so many different models of well-being, but pretty much every model has that, you know, that sort of whānau or the community or that connection, that support, for, you know, is such an important part of that model. And for me personally, that was a huge help for me. Right. The support from Fano definitely, but also friends and also, you know, um, community. I'm also part of a Buddhist organisation, so oh. support from that organisation. So, yeah, that's helped me personally with my own mental health. Well, we, we have a great supporter of Buddhism who's a psychologist who comes in. Uh, she's done about 25 different shows uh, as a psychologist talking about things like an- anxiety and depression and post-traumatic Vicky Bear. Yes, yeah, she's a good friend of mine and she's the one that yeah, put us in touch oh, know, years ago. Yeah, yeah. right. Oh, yeah, so we're part of the same organisation and we do a lot of work around this as well yeah. through that organisation. Yeah, yeah. Well, she took me along to a chanting uh, uh, exercise in Newmarket and, uh, yeah, I really loved that, actually. It, yeah. it was very sort of energetic and I ended up sort of sweat all over me <laughs> doing this chanting. But, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> you're, you've worked as a consumer advisor for a DHB. Um, I mean, all of that's suggest uh, and what you disclosed about um, well talking online about your mental health uh, what what occurred what occurred in your life mm-hmm. uh, to cause challenges with mental health cool um, so I think lots of different stuff eh? I don't think we all come in with one thing that really set it all off for us um, uh, firstly I think and the biggest thing for me was uh, just growing up in a home, like a lot of young people, where there were a, a dynamic there that made me feel really unsafe. Um, I happened to grow up with parents who had their own incredibly challenging childhoods and unfortunately didn't get any support with it. Um, and so I grew up as adults who struggled, <laughs> you know, struggled to be parents, struggled to be, you know, in a marriage, spouses, um, and be able to cope with everyday life. And as a result, I experienced that stress vicariously and directly. So lots of family violence, lots of physical abuse. Um, and, yeah, that was challenging to have to handle as a young person. Um, and I think the second thing, you know, that's really big and it is still kind of ongoing, but I hold it in a different way now, is um, my ethnic identity. So I was born in India. I'm Indian. Um, and I came to New Zealand when I was seven and grew up in New Zealand and fairly acculturated, you know. Um, but still, like, a lot of people of colour struggle with feeling connected in terms of my cultural identity to New Zealand, you know. Like, there's this constant um, opposing process between your ancestral culture and New Zealand mainstream Pākehā culture. I always felt like the world that I occupied wasn't made for me. Um, and for me, healing from that was about integrating the two in my own bespoke way, you know, my own bespoke cultural identity. Um, but that's a really hard and challenging thing to have to kind of create. How would your transition from India to New Zealand, you know, you were very, quite young. Uh, yeah. I guess you, you, you left friends behind, school behind, all yeah. of those things had to come into a new environment. Do you think yeah. that contributed? Um, no, interestingly. Um, my sister and I did pretty well. We really enjoyed school. Um, I, I think the defining thing for us was that we came into a community that had... It was very multicultural. So I grew up in Mount Ross School um, and diversity was celebrated and being different was all good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it was easy to, you know, transition there. Yeah. Um, what really was difficult was my parents coming into... Um, a context that's not actually very different to right now, where immigration was a hot-button topic, where immigrants were portrayed as, you know, 
um, rotting the system, taking jobs, you know, having cultural values that were not compatible with Kiwi culture. Buying our properties. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So um, they really struggle with that. They experience the direct racist vitriol that um, I was lucky to be shielded from in a very safe and loving community. So, yeah. so I was just going to quickly jump in there and say, you know, with the um, the whole uh, prejudice thing, do you think that's because people don't understand cultures enough, the cultures? Yeah, I think um, what people don't understand, like I, I can only speak from an, a new perspective, so I'm yeah, just going to start from there, is that we are a country of a billion people, <laughs> right. a billion people. You look at parliament, just the difference of opinion amongst white males there. You know, imagine that over a billion people, different gender, different religion, different, um, actually different cultural contexts as well, because I'm different from another Indian from another part of India, right? So um, I think, yeah, what I see is this homogenizing of our entire community. Yeah. I was going to say, it's like um, Christchurch, South Island versus... Um the North Island. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, we're the mainland in the South Island, so we've got the, the uh, oh, preeminent position. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm from Christchurch, so yeah. uh, yes, I'm a little biased when it comes to <laughs> the North Island and the South Island. Um, it, Lisa, your your sort of introduction to mental health. Um, yeah, where did that uh, originate? Good question. Um, so I kind of come from a line of different women who've struggled with mental health. In fact, quite a few of them have been here in Carrington when it was a psychiatric hospital. So, um, and a lot of it was triggered by having children. So it was postnatal distress. So me personally, you know, I grew up um, around a lot of um, mental distress and that sort of thing. And then I, and also struggling myself with it as well. And then I think when when it came to the idea of having children, what I did is I thought, well, maybe I just won't have them because, you know, you know, seeing, you know, every single female ancestor seemed to be fine until they had them and then <laughs> it all went pear shape. I thought, well, maybe I just won't have them. So any time I got into a relationship and started getting serious or talking about kids, I thought, oh, write them off. Off we go. So, <laughs> and then, um, so anyway, fast forward a little bit, I, um, I met uh, a guy at my birthday party and, um, he is uh, actually a mix of Chinese and Tuhoi and Ngāti Paro. So quite an interesting mix, Māori Chinese. Anyway, he, um, we got on well. And not long after, he started talking about children because he comes from a huge whānau. So, you know, all of his brothers and sisters have, you know, at least eight, eight kids, if not more, <laughs> and get started young, you know. So I was like, ah. So <laughs> when no that, pressure. <laughs> no pressure. So when that sort of topic came up, I was like, ah. So I was quite honest about it. Anyway, I did um, I did get pregnant with my first child and then panicked a bit. And um, after having my first child, I did struggle definitely with mental distress. And, and what I um, found helpful for me was, as I mentioned before, one huge thing for me was that, you know, that support and that, you know, his whānau is huge and they're wonderful and they basically pretty much moved in. Oh, and said, really? you're struggling, we come to help. So How many? Or? Well, quite a few. Oh, family. <laughs> Usually travelling groups of 30, yes. Oh, right. <laughs> it's just wonderful, which I love, you know, because I... You had the bus parked outside. <laughs> so she needs to rest, you know. You go have a moi, you need to do the washing, you fix some kai, you da 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 So everyone is doing stuff and helping, and that was wonderful. My family was the same, was really supportive. Um, friends, and then the SGI community, the chanting community came in, you know, and supported with food and chanting and things. So I was personally so lucky to have all of that support, and I know a lot of people aren't, but it's how can we create our own support networks around us mm. when actually we don't feel like we want it or need it right then. We feel like we want to isolate ourselves, and me personally, I was like, I just want to be alone, you know, but actually that I found it was the best thing for me, having that connection Did and you, that you got used to all the support and uh, yeah. re- requested it uh, More, full time? Yeah. Second uh, child, I actually in advance said, right, who's moving in? Can oh, organise no. it now, please? Get it all organised. Oh, wow. But, yeah, so for me, you know, one thing we talked um, quite a bit about in the training, I, as we mentioned, was these models of well-being and just looking at te whare tapa you know, the, the, the Māori approach to well-being, 
And I, I really love the idea of these four walls, you know, the Taha Wairua, the Taha Hinangaro, the Taha Tinana and the Taha Fano. For me, the, you know, everyone's different in terms of what really helps. For me, the Fano, that family, that friends, that social wall was really important. But actually, I really need to make sure all four walls are in place for me all of the time. And when I start to struggle, I actually have a look back and go, okay, what's, what's kind of missing here right now? So for me, the taha wairua is, you know, is that sense of spirituality. For me, I do my chanting practice twice a day. I have, I do also yoga, which goes into the tinana, the physical. I love walking, cycling. You know, I find what I'm struggling, I need to get outside, do some exercise, that sort of thing. Um, and just in terms of the hinengaro, the the you know, the mental, emotional side of it. For me, I have to get quite staunch with my self-care and really listen to myself and go, ah, I've just taken on too much or I've got to set boundaries there or actually I really need some time out right now, you know, because I have a tendency to take a lot on and get quite excited about things and then kind of burn out a bit. So <laughs> so that's really important. And, yeah, and, of course, the taha Fano. So for me it's always looking at which of those four things is kind of down a bit and can I just you know really focus on bringing that back up so that all four walls are working together and that, and of course they're all on the fenu on the land and I need to get out into nature personally like west coast you know have a walk on the west coast beach kare kare or somewhere like that and that always makes me feel a lot better get yeah. things back into perspective on your own or with company either way but yeah I just love like when when it's huge mountains and crashing waves and I just go oh Oh, my problems I was so focused on have got smaller. So how they kind of gets them back into perspective a little bit. Yeah, yeah. wonderful. You're with Take It From Us on 104.6 Planet FM. And I'm Sheldon Brown on Take It From Us, uh, and that was uh, Declan playing music today. We're talking to uh, both uh, Lisa Brickle and uh, Shreya Rao about uh, tall trees. Uh, this is uh, the, the latest Like Minds, Like Mine campaign, and in fact, uh, both Lisa and Shreya are mentors and facilitators, so they're going to be helping to train uh, the champions of this Rakao Roroa uh, campaign. Um, uh, but uh, Lisa and Treya have uh, shared their uh, a, a little bit about uh, their experience of mental health. I just wonder, has it been a positive or negative experience? Uh, I mean, has it influenced you in coming in to, to work on Raka Ra Ra? Um, I think for me, I think with any mental health experience, while you're in it, you're kind of like, this is the worst thing ever. And then you get out of it and you're like, oh, yeah. That makes sense. Um, so lots of positives and negatives, eh? Um, I think for me the biggest insight I gained was uh, this concept of resilience. Um, often people say, you know, when you go through hard stuff, you come out stronger. And, yeah, I, I guess I agree with that to an extent. But for me, my personal perspective is that I realised how strong I could be um, and really gained an appreciation for the resilience, the inherent resilience that human beings have. Yeah. Um, so and yeah. has that protected, protected you from further yeah. experiences of mental health? Yeah, and I think like lots of people, I've had my ups and downs, and every time there's a down, it's kind of like, well, you've, you've done this before, and you actually have skills that you can use. Um, so you, you, get, you get some runs on the board, and yeah, it gives yeah. you confidence that you can... Yeah fall back on that resilience yeah and I think that's a really powerful thing for a young person is when you have your first experience it's kind of like the worst thing ever and you really don't see that out and then when you do come out the other side it's it's like oh okay <laughs> and there is another side and um I always hold on to that and it's made things easier it's made things quicker when I go back downhill right. again yeah, yeah. But, but uh, have you been able to um, not fall right down the hole um, these days so that, that you've got this resilience and yeah. protection? Um, I think, you know, it's, it's always the same things that lead me, you know, back down. Um, but it's a, it's a different... I see it in a different way. You know, it's a different element to have to deal with. Like, when I was younger and I was going through things, I didn't put two and two together. I didn't put what was happening to me at the time and what I'm feeling 
together and understand actually how those things linked up. Um, and then when I got older, you know, I still experienced an intense amount of distress, but I understood how things in my life were potentially impacting the way that I felt. Um, so I had a different approach to it. So I think for me, the big difference is just how I've approached it and how I've held the problem and how I've seen my role in terms of addressing the problem um, and my expectations of other people too. So I don't um, expect people to save me. Right. Yeah. It's all down to us. Yeah. We are the experts on our own uh, health and yeah. mental health. Yeah. And I think a realisation of that, it's wonderful coming at, at your age, uh, Shreya, because it uh, took me another 20 years or 30 years <laughs> to, before I realised that yeah. I was personally responsible for my own wellness. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you, Lisa, the, the, the experiences you had with postnatal uh, depression, uh, in the end, uh, was there a positive or a negative outcome? Yeah, well, I think... Of course, as Shreya was saying, you know, during that time, it's definitely not positive <laughs> in the middle of it all. But, yeah, definitely um, later um, for me, what I thought is that, you know, that, that idea of now I can help other people in a similar position with things that work for me. And, again, of course, in terms of recovery, everyone's so different in terms of what works for them. But if I share some of my experiences and my stories and what's helped me, um, some of that might be able to help other people and I think that's really the basis of Rāku Roroa is that thing of people sharing their own stories of recovery and of hope means that other people might be able to take some bits from it, especially people who are really amidst it all and really struggling there might be little bits that they can that we might find. Well I think it gives you two great credibility because you've been there, you've shared the pain, um, you know about the pain you, and you have um, adopted strategies uh, to try and prevent that from happening again and uh, those strategies can be useful to other people. Mm. I mean it's not about giving advice I suppose but tell us a bit more how, about how you think Raka Rara is going to work for, for you two. Uh, I mean you're going to be training and mentoring these people but will you actually be out there um, you know promoting the messages yeah so um, I think where we see fit really um, one of our one of the people in my group is um, in the theatre does a lot of his own plays um, so I'll be going out there supporting him in his future ventures but also promoting it um, there's also another young person in our group that identifies as uh, South Asian, so from the same kind of um, areas where I was born. Um, so I'm interested in talking to her about how we could potentially progress um, the anti-stigma and discrimination work. You're with Take It From Us on 104.6 Planet FM. And I'm Sheldon Brown. We're uh, talking to uh, Lisa and Shreya from the Tall Trees Raka Ra Ra uh, campaign, a Like Minds Like Mine uh, campaign. Um, and uh, before the music break, uh, Shreya mentioned uh, the medical model, which uh, I've been exposed to uh, earlier this year and uh, um, is uh, sort of pill-dominated, uh, which <laughs> I have some... Uh, uh, push against. Um, so, Shreya, you mentioned, uh, you know, the prospect of alternative uh, therapies. What are some that uh, that you champion? Um, so, not specifically alternative therapies, um, but uh, different models of mental well-being. So, we have one particular exercise that um, you, you kind of agree, disagree, or sort of partially agree with that statement. And statements are like. I believe that mental health is caused by chemical imbalances. I believe that mental health issues are caused by um, trauma in, pe in your life. Um, and you, you sort of go around putting either green dot, you agree with it, or uh, orange dot, no, you don't agree with it. Um, and it's just a range of kind of statements across a range of different um, perspectives that people in our community have. Um, when it comes to mental health, so spiritual, talked a little bit about that, um, psychological, uh, yeah, social, all that kind of stuff. Um, and it's just an exercise to illustrate to our tall trees that there are different perspectives um, and you should 
be entertaining lots of different ideas um, because they all mean there are different possibilities for you. There are different possibilities in terms of ways that you can enrich your life. There are different possibilities in the way that you can see yourself and relate to others. Um, and none of them are, you know, better than others. Um, it's just about kind of how you hold that um, and how you respect that for other people too. What is the correct answer to the question uh, that mental health is caused by chemical imbalance? Um, so that's kind of the one thing that we haven't really proved um, and that's kind of what we'll be telling. We, right. we don't actually have evidence around that but certainly um, there are some prospects to um, pharmacological approaches to um, addressing mental health stuff. Yeah, pharmacological uh, solutions being um, medications. Yeah, um, nutrition as well. That can have a huge impact on your um, your physical health, um, which has a huge impact on your mental health. Yeah. Yeah. And walking Lisa on the beach at Kerry Kerry. Oh, yeah, I love doing that. <laughs> Yeah, we do. We do sort of tend to forget uh, the wonders of those sorts of things. You know, we might sit at home, and I mean, I, I suddenly re um, found just the waterfront of Auckland. You know, the Mission Bay, and walking around there, or cycling around there, or sitting at St Helier's having uh, some sushi or something like that. You know, and it's a wonderful place to be walking. I, I loved, we did a whole lot of exercises around listening to all these different points of view and not saying, no, you're wrong, I'm actually right. Yeah, no, that's completely wrong. You know, we actually went, okay, that's your point of view, you know. Even when people say things to you that are actually really quite challenging. We, we talked about the curly questions sometimes you get. And instead of just going, no, we actually really listen and say, oh, where are they coming from? What's behind all of this? You know, And, and then just gently kind of steering them back into some of the key messages yeah. around this program. I think that's very important too because if people aren't listening, they're not learning mm. and you can get great empowerment from that because like I've had my diagnosis for what many, many moons now but I'm always learning something new and mm. always open to learning because how do I know that somebody hasn't got something to share that's actually going to go, oh, righto, and that's going to help me mm. in my journey. Yeah, so it's mm. been always open to learning and, that's, and you do learn from people that sometimes you think you might initially disagree with or something actually open to listening to them. And never be ashamed yeah. to um, admit you've got a mental illness. Totally. The only thing I say yeah. to people is, when they say, oh, hi, my name's Tracy and I'm bipolar, I say, no, you're Tracy and you have bipolar, because yeah. otherwise you can easily identify with your mental illness as, as that being the whole core of you. Yes, 